Hello. 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 Oh, man. Well, uh, I just want to say thank you for worshiping with us today. And I know it's a holiday weekend and some of you guys have some awesome plans. Some of you don't have awesome plans. Raise your hand if you don't have awesome plans. Okay, go ahead and um, I'll invite you all to my house. We'll just have a party. So if you have plans, you can't come. Can't change your plans. If you don't have plans, yeah, just come on over. My wife's in the nursery today, so she doesn't know anything about it, so I can do whatever I want. <laughs> we, we've had... Um, we've had a... A weekend of ups and downs, a week of ups and downs here at Abundant Life as a family. And um, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, yesterday we had the opportunity to celebrate um, the life of Sue Cross, who worked here for over 32 years. Um, She passed away in her home on Tuesday of this week. And um, one of the things that marked Sue's life was uh, her joy and her constant surrender to the Father and her desire to see him and walk with him. And it's just, it's, it's settling in my heart to know today that Sue is walking uh, with the Lord and, and with her child that went before her. And, um, but we, we mourn together as a family and we work through the process of grieving. And um, so I want to encourage you to continue to pray for her family and, and uh, those who are, are uh, walking through that process of mourning. Uh, I say it was a week of extremes because, you know, we got to celebrate, but we got to mourn with the family. And we also yesterday got to celebrate um, a different kind of funeral uh, in the form of a wedding that one young... <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. My wife's in the nursery. I can say whatever I want today. <laughs> That's a joke. We got to celebrate with the Burnses and the Young family. So you guys, good to see you. Uh, you're awake and alive and looking good, actually. So, it, you know, and it, yesterday was kind of a picture of life for me personally. There's times when what the heck is going on and you question what, what was God's intention? What was his plan? I mean, everything came so unexpected and so quickly, and we didn't have time to really process or grieve or, or do any of those things. And, you know, then you have times when you just get to let loose and dance and celebrate, and, and, and it's, it's life. It's what happens in life. And we as Christians... We're not above circumstances. We're not above situations. We're not above all those things that happen in life that some you can't even control. But we have the opportunity to see things from a different perspective that produce in us the very thing that I've been talking about for the past few weeks. It's hope. It's hope in the form of expectation, of expecting that we serve a loving and good God. And we've, we've, we work through this process of the Holy Spirit and how He moves and how we live a lifestyle of expectation. And for me, this week has challenged that expectation. I know I'm supposed to be a pastor and I'm supposed to be above all that and perfect and holy. And I've, but if you could just go ahead, and I'm going to get off that pedestal for a while. And if you could just take me off that pedestal for a while... It's a very lonely place to live. But my expectation was challenged. Because of waves. Because of circumstances. Because I didn't think that God's plan should have gone exactly that way. I feel like I could have figured this thing out a little better than he, he did. And I don't know about any of you else have this issue, but I have this thing that I really just to be, love to be in control of everything that's in front of me. Anyone else like that? Some of you just nudged your spouse. You're like that. Raise your hand. And when I get outside of that comfort, that control, I get a little, uh, I get a little crazy sometimes and I 
honestly believe it's those seasons who make us who we are. I don't know about you, but this morning where I want to get to is kind of, it is the finalization of this Holy Spirit message and in, um, Holy Spirit series that we're doing. And we talked about the power of God, and we talked about who the Holy Spirit is. We talked about what He does. We talked about how He operates. We talked about how we position ourselves to live a lifestyle of supernatural strength through the Holy Spirit. We, we talked about that purpose, and the purpose of the Holy Spirit was to reveal Jesus, that anything He does, it's to point to Jesus. It's not about the fruit or the miracles. It's about Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. When we worship, it's about Jesus. When we get into the Word, it's about Jesus, because Jesus leads to relationship with the Father, and He's the only way to relationship with the Father. When we talk about eternity, and we talk about you know, what God does, he, His plan was, I need to send the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus so that eternity with me can happen. It's all about Jesus. And we, we, we laid those things out. But today I want to talk about the other side of the coin. Yes, we should have an expectation for supernatural things to happen in our lives. We should have an expectation for restoration. We should have an expectation that when we come together in worship that we sense and feel His presence and that He moves and changes us from what we have been to what He's called us to be. We have an expectation that the road set before us was set before us by God and the good things He has are before us. When we have that expectation, but my question is, what happens when God doesn't? What happens when He does not move the way I feel like He should move? What happens when someone that I love very dearly, unexpectedly, out of the blue, goes to be with him? Well, that brings me to a crossroads in my life. What happens when when the young man that I'm praying for to receive this healing and this breakthrough, what happens when he doesn't get his, his healing or his breakthrough? What happens in our relationship that I'm praying for that I know that God wants to restore? What if if it's a year down the road and I don't see anything happening? I don't see hope. What happens then? Have you guys ever asked those questions? Have you guys ever asked God those things? Like, what are you doing and what are you thinking? Every time we come to one of those points, it leads us to a crossroads where we have a choice. If you know me, you know that I love, I don't love. I do not shy away very often from confrontation because I believe that confrontation brings us to a place of decision. When there's confrontation in your life, it's not something you run away from, it's something you run to and you figure it out and you listen and you you voice and you get to a place of decision because that place of decision is going to lead you the direction that God has for you. But sometimes God just doesn't make sense to me. Anyone else there? This week, God did not make sense to me. I'm pretty sure it's not a problem with him, though. I think it's a problem with my understanding. And so I've I've dug. It caused me to dig into the word. It caused me to ask questions. And since since we're talking about how God doesn't make sense... I'd like to start with a word that most of us think we understand, but we really don't. I do this a lot, you know. I, I question everything that we, you know, in church and, and our, our, in religion and, and all of this. I love it. I love digging into the word. But I, I, I want to question things that we think we know. Because it's those things that we think we know that will hold us back from the true identity of who God is. And, and, and what I want us to understand today is the word comfort. Can you say that with me? Say comfort. The history of the word comfort reveals the evolving way we see God's footprint in our life, in our difficulties, in our pain. But the word itself is made from two Latin words. Two Latin words, and, and they're parts, and I have, a, I have a slide because I'm a visual learner. It's back there, but it's not. A comfort. It's made from two words. It's actually calm. It's a Latin word, which is calm, which basically means together or with. And fortis, which means strong 
or strength. Now we read comfort and, I'm sorry, it, 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 to strength. Eventually, uh, this word was taken out of Latin. And, and you, how many know the Bible? This, a, lot of, a lot of it was written not in English. Okay? It was translated into English, and we use English words to try to describe something that sometimes we just can't fully describe. So when we read the Bible and we see things, and maybe you don't understand things, it's important to, to know how to study and how to, how to dig into it. But later the Latin word confortare, confortare, you can take that slide down, conforte, confortare, came to mean to strengthen much. Eventually an old French word, confortare, would add words like solace and help to the definition. In the 14th century, another French word, conforten, is defined as to cheer up or to console. And finally, by the 17th century, the English version of the word implies the sense of physical ease that we understand today. We read comfort. And when I say the word, everybody, just once again, close your eyes for a second. I'm not going to trick you. Just close your eyes for a second. I said close your eyes. I'm just kidding. When I say the word comfort, what immediately pops into your head? Don't even think about it. A blanket. Pablo's blankie. When I think of comfort, I think of my home. My home is very comfortable. I have a couch that I sink into, and I wrap myself in all these pillows, and I can just... ah. What do you think of when you have comfort? Maybe it's a, a, a special meal that someone prepares for you every Thanksgiving. Or maybe, what is comfort? Maybe it's your favorite pillow. We all have this idea in our brains when I say comfort of what that means. We read things of as pillows or, or amenities or maybe your, your favorite pair of sweatpants. But in about a millennia, the word went from meaning together, strong, to meaning pain, barrier. Why do we think? Because we're safe in this place. When we think of comfort, we think of uh, just, this is safe. This is, nothing can touch me here. I can turn off my phone. Nobody can call me. Nobody can text me. And I can just sit here on my couch and nothing, the world is gone. You see, the word went from meaning together strength to meaning pain barrier. We went from understanding God's comfort as his company. I'm going to say this very slowly so that I can understand it. We went from understanding God's comfort in the original of that word as his company to understanding it as his intervention. You see, when he says, I've come to give you comfort, he doesn't say, I've come to give you intervention. He says, I've come to be with you. I've come to be together with you for strength. He he comforts those who mourn. That doesn't mean he's, he's coming in and he's just absolutely taking away all the pain and all the frustration and all the situations. No, when he says he comforts those who mourn, he says, I am coming to be with you because my strength is enough for whatever's going on. When something terrible happens and we don't see God intervene, we sometimes wonder whether he's really there at all. We begin to ask questions of God. We begin to, 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 to see things in different perspectives. We see people walk away from church all the time because God didn't work for them or the church didn't work for them. But this isn't something new. This is something that we see. Old Testament, New Testament. I want to take you very quickly to Psalms chapter 13. Before comfort, before the comfort word morphed into something that it wasn't, King David's letters to God, and he tries to keep pace with his seemingly varying take on God and his struggle and understanding who God is in his struggle and understanding what God wants from him in the time of his struggle. Psalms chapter 13. If you would go there with me, it's a very short chapter. I'm going to read it all. And in this chapter, we see this, we, we see this varying, it's like 
David is bipolar in this thing. He's like thinking one thing one second, and then he's somewhere else the next second. But it's this process that he's walking through. And I want you, as we read this, maybe you can find yourself in this process. Maybe there's some circumstance or situation that you're walking through, that you've dealt with, that you can see yourself in this process. But it says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me? Forever? How many of you have asked that question? God, have you forgotten about me? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But... I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This wasn't a time of victory and parades in the life of David. This was a time when he felt distant from God. He heard God the very first verse and he says, How long will you keep yourself away from me? Because I look at the circumstances around me right now and I don't see your goodness and your mercy and your love. He was struggling in this place. But the very last two verses, verses 5 and 6, are verses that he turns his heart and he turns his face back towards God. He said, but I know that there's hope. Why? Because I've seen you do it before in my life. I've seen you work in my life. I've seen who you are. I've seen that together we can be strong. So I don't seek provision. I don't seek victory over my... What I seek is you, God. How many times in your life have you dealt with circumstances and situations and you try to figure it out and you try to do it your own way, but all you need to do and all God is calling you to do is look to Him and understand comfort. Understand that together with God, you're strong. If you would go with me again in the New Testament, into the book of James. Do we all understand comfort? It means together with God, together strong. His call for us is to live in a place of comfort, but not in the comfort that you think. It's in a place of anything formed, no no weapon formed against me shall prosper. That's what comfort is. It doesn't mean that there's no more weapons. It means anything that forms against me shall not prosper. Why? Because I understand that together with God, there is strength. Are you guys with me today? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. <laughs> is that ever, is, this makes no sense. How many of you, when you fall into various trials, you consider it joy? Oh, come on, am I the only one who's going to be real today? When I got a call on Tuesday morning from the deputy of Hamilton County, I did not just consider it all joy. It was not joyful. Because I understood the situation that I was about to walk into. But just because I wasn't walking in it doesn't mean it wasn't God's plan. His plan was... Consider it all joy when you walk through various trials. Consider it joy when you walk through various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. 
Verse 4 says, But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's pretty bold. For me to be able to stand up here and say, Listen, I am perfect and complete and lacking nothing. That's a pretty bold statement. But God says, if you understand this principle, if you can understand what I'm saying through this, what, where I'm getting to, if you can understand that, that even in, in your doubts, in your unbelief, in your, in your struggling, if you would allow this process to work in you and you will keep your eyes on the author and the finish of your faith, then pr- the, the product of that understanding, the product of that life is... And it's perfect, complete, and lacking nothing. But sometimes we don't like the process. C.S. Lewis, the well-known author and theologian, wrote, We're not necessarily doubting that God will do the best for us. We are wondering how painful the best will turn out to be. I'm going to say that again. We are not necessarily doubting that God will do the best for us. We are wondering how painful the best will turn out to be. I want you to think back to what we learned about the word comfort is together and strength. And if God's comfort is his strong company, then a difficult situation could be something we face with the powerful and loving comfort of God's presence. In fact, it's hard to see it this way, but the situation itself could at times be God's strength for us. The situation that you're walking through, the struggle or your week or your your job, whatever it is, can be God's strength for us. Now, it's... I'm not trying to create a theology here because it's a dangerous theology to describe every difficulty as something that God intends us to make us grow. That's not what I'm trying to put on him. But it is equally risky to say that God never puts us through a test in order to strengthen us and build perseverance and patience. You know, you have people on both, both sides of the, of, of the road here where you say, no, God... You know, God's doing this in your life so that he can build this thing. And, and other people say, no, God would never do anything like that. Well, there's a road that goes straight down the middle that is called the sovereignty of God. And if you live in one of the ditches, you're going to find yourself in a lot of trouble at some point because something that's happening isn't matching with what you believe. And so everything that it's all going to come against you and you're going to begin to doubt and have unbelief and things like that. But the knowledge that his strength is with us and that we come out stronger through our circumstances holds in it the power to separate us from our need to know, God, how could you let this happen? I don't know if you've ever asked that question. God, how did you let this happen? I have people come and ask me all the time, why would a good and loving God let this happen? And I have the best answer for them because I'm the pastor and I always have the answers. I don't know. That's an answer, right, Gene? I don't know is an answer. might not be what you want to hear. But my question would be in those times of questioning and times of struggle and times of saying, God, how could you let this happen, would be, okay, is God with you? And is he strong? Then he is your comfort. Who am I? Who are we as, hu- as finite beings to understand an infinite God? How is that? How arrogant of me to think that I would even understand? Now, he gives me glimpses and revelations of who he is and his love, and he gives me direction through his word. And if I ever need anything more than that, if I ever say I have to have more than that in order to believe, then I'm living in a place of doubt and unbelief. And in other words, when God doesn't make sense, maybe it's okay. When things didn't go as planned, maybe it's okay. Maybe it's enough to know that he's Emmanuel, God with us, and he has the power to turn what's hard for us into what's good for us. I know people who have walked through 
circumstances and struggles that I would not wish on anyone. With my friends, the Moors, many others of you. I wouldn't wish some of the things that the, the pain and the, and, the, and the frustration and the questioning. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. But my question is, is it, is it enough just to know that he is God with us? That his plans are above our plans and he is, has the power to turn what's hard into what's good. I use Ecclesiastes chapter 3 in a lot of weddings and even Gene used it yesterday in a funeral. And it was, it was, uh, it was appropriate in both places where there are seasons in life. And there are appropriate times set aside by God. And there, there are times that we, we mourn and there's times we rejoice and there's times to plant and there's times to harvest. And there's times, to do, there's times uh, to, for everything under the sun. Some of you thought that that just was a song that the birds sang. And Gene's not here so he can't tell me what year. 1972, 67, there you go. But it's It's scripture. And understanding that even though some of those seasons of our lives aren't exactly what we planned, not exactly what we had in mind, but it's those very seasons and how we react to those seasons that create who we are and create the perfect will and the perfect plan that God has for us. Why? Because I understand that through difficult circumstances, it produces something in me. We just read it in James chapter 1. It produces faith. It produces wisdom. It produces a lifestyle where I lack nothing because I understand that I am in relationship with the one who gives everything. You look back and you think about the struggles you faced and remember how they built your character, your perseverance, your faith. And you find a way to thank God for all of it. Because he is together, strong. We experienced something this week for me that was, for all of us, that was difficult. And if you've lived any period of time, you've most likely experienced death. And no matter who we lose or how we lose them, death is arguably the most difficult thing in life that we may face. Maybe it's the seeming finality of death that is so hard. When in comparison, every other pain or sickness we experience seems treatable or preventable or repairable or at least tolerable. But for many followers of Christ, the moment when we realize a loved one is really gone is when we experience our deepest doubts of who God is and his plan. And our thoughts turn into prayers of, God, how could you let this happen? Or are you even listening? Or do you care? Or even you there at all? Basically, we accuse God of being either an imposing fake or just not nice when we're dealing with these frustrations and circumstances. And even outside of the church, you see people who walked away from God because of these very questions. I don't want to see any of you walk away from God, walk away from church in the time of circumstances. I want to see you press in. There's a, there's a story in the Bible that all of you may know, but when close friends and followers of Jesus named Mary and Martha, they told them that their brother Lazarus, who was Jesus' friend, was sick and dying Jesus didn't immediately rise up and come like they wanted him to and that they, they felt like the plan should be. Even though he was only a day's walk away, Jesus stayed and he continued to minister and Lazarus died. And Mary and Martha were grieving and he finally came. And when he did arrive, Lazarus was already decaying in a sealed grave. Mary stayed home and Martha let Jesus know that he was late, that he had messed up, that he's... She's like, I told you what was going on and you didn't come. And Jesus called for Mary in the story and she came weeping. And Jesus' response to Mary and Martha are some of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible to me personally in times of struggle like this. It says, when Martha told Jesus he could have kept Lazarus in death, Jesus responded, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Then when Mary wept, Jesus wept. Now listen, Jesus didn't weep because Lazarus was dead, because he just said, I am the resurrection and the life. He understood who he was, and he understood the plan of God. He wept because Mary wept, and he loved Mary. 
See, it's so easy to get mad at God and frustrated with God in times of trouble, in times of circumstance, when family's sick and when, when all these things are happening. But listen, when you weep, Jesus weeps. He didn't weep because Lazarus was dead. He knew what he was going to happen. He wept because his friend hurt. Together, strong. When you understand that in the midst of your struggle, in the midst of your frustration, in the midst of your hurt and your pain, Jesus is weeping with you. Why? Because he loves you. How great a feeling it is to know that the king of the universe, the savior of all, he he, he looks at you and he understands your circumstance and he knows that you're hurting and he weeps with you because together you're strong. He brings comfort. Jesus' tears paint not only a picture of God who hurts when we hurt, but also God who hurts because we hurt. He doesn't hurt just when you hurt. He hurts Sometimes because you hurt. He is not the origin of death and separation. Sin is. He is the very one who looked death in the eye and conquered it for us. He understands better than we the true effects of death in the world and life. And the life that he created for us. So just because he doesn't stop pain from happening to us doesn't mean he doesn't hurt with us. If you finish the story, you know that Jesus wept right before he brought Lazarus back to life. He also knows that for whoever believes in him, including the people that we love and the people that we've lost, death is not permanent. It is a transition, and life with him is eternal. The same Jesus who called Lazarus back from the grave is calling you today and calling me into this life of living more abundantly and living a life of comfort and peace. You may be lonely today, but he is with you always. You may be crying today, but he's crying with you. You may be anxious, but he cares for you. You may be tired, he is your rest. You may be lost, he is the lamp unto your feet and the light unto your path. You may be angry, he is love. He is peace. You may be broken. He was wounded to heal you. You may be addicted. He is freedom. You may be in darkness. He is the light of the world. You may be dying. He is the resurrection and the life. When God seems inattentive, uncooperative, and, 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 and late, these are the moments when we, go to, we get to decide what we really believe about him. Do we believe the Bible stories that we read? Do we, re, do we believe the word of God? Even when we decide to believe the Bible is true, we may still sometimes feel like God doesn't make sense. Yet we can be sure the same Jesus still hears our cries, shares our pain, and saves us. He is our together strength, our comfort. Those of you who know me know I have three beautiful, wonderful children. My son Caden is 15 this year. He's an awesome young man. Don't stop. He really is a good, he's a good kid. Uh, My daughter Bella who is going to the bathroom right now. Oh, coming from the bathroom? What were you two doing? Were you snap-a-gramming during church? Insta-snapping? Insta-chatting? Whatever. A beautiful daughter, Bella, who this year starts middle school. She'll be a sixth grader. She's so cute. Watch this. Oh, you can't see her. You're so pretty. No, you're not going to do it? Okay. And then we have our youngest, Sophia, who is six. Five. She'll be six at the end of this month. She's starting kindergarten this year. And uh, after Bella, after we had Bella, Caden uh, and Bella have a pretty good four or five year gap in between them. And we wanted to have a, a child a lot quicker. So 
they wouldn't be so separated so they could, you know, we just, that's where we were in life. And uh, it didn't take long, but uh, my wife got pregnant and uh, everything was going perfect. We, you know, we were um, about six months in to the process and we were going for our, uh, for our, they call that a sonogram where you get to see the baby and you get to hear the heartbeat and all that. And we'd done it before and everything was perfect. And we went into the room and, um, and we, got, we were excited, you know, we were happy. I always cry in these situations because I'm a bit of a crier. Uh, and so we went in and, and something wasn't right. And they had the picture there. And um, we, were, we were looking at the, we were looking and we were searching and, you know, something wasn't right. And then, so the, the lady left and she's, hold on a second, let me go get a doctor. And so the doctor came in and, and she, you know, sp- sprayed the blue goo all over my wife. And then they just looked at her tummy and we're looking and, and, you know, the baby was there. We could see the baby, but there wasn't a heartbeat. And so we walked into a room feeling excited and going after it. And we we're like, this is, yeah, this was God's plan. We, you know, he's a giver of good gifts. We have this new baby and our other two are awesome. And so this one must be just insanely, incredibly awesome. And we walked out of that room in tears, understanding that my wife was going to have to go through a procedure and an operation to, you know, to remove everything and, and, This wasn't God's plan. This wasn't our plan. This was our promise. We were supposed to be, this wasn't our intention. And it took about three years for us to decide that, you know, we still want a kid. You know, we still, we don't feel like we're complete and we're a family. And so, you know, we started again. And I have a picture of, we we ended up getting pregnant. Everything went, went well and and I have a picture of Sophia up here. If you don't know my daughter, this is Sophia. <laughs> that is uh, our baby Sophia. She's five. She's about to be six. But Sophia is here because she's a promise that came through a lot of pain. Sophia wouldn't be here if we didn't walk through a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. And a lot of suffering. And now we can't imagine our life without that bundle of non-stop, never slow down, no fear, wonderfulness. You can take that down. But she's here because we, we get to enjoy her and love her because God had a plan. And it included some pain. It included some hurt. It included a lot of loss, a lot of tears. She's an incredible blessing that came through the healing and the comfort that God walked us through, my wife and I. It would have been easy just to say, okay, we're done, that's it. But we knew that it wasn't a complete work and our family wasn't complete. I don't understand God. And that's okay. I don't understand why he brings some home quickly and others live long lives when I probably maybe would have done things a little differently. I don't understand it. And that's okay. Because I know that he's my strength. I know that he's my comfort. I know that he turns beauty from ashes. He gives us strength for fear, gladness for mourning, and peace for despair. Today, I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know if this has been a great week or a poor week. It doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is God is a God of comfort in your life. And that is not a God of just making you feel good or keeping pain away from you. He is a God that together you walk strong. You want to you know the key to walking and living a lifestyle of the Holy Spirit. It's not these ups and downs and, oh my gosh, I did ministry and I saw somebody saved and did a miracle. And did a, all of these things happen and we see these fruit. No, it's a continual lifestyle of understanding that God is strong and I walk with him. 
that when the world around me is is a storm and turmoil, that I walk with him. I want to give you a chance today to respond. In just a moment, I'm going to I'm going to show you this video, and I'll just set this video up just a little bit. It's just, it was a time of worship in, 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 a, in a church, and Pastor Bill Johnson was, was there, and he wanted to explain this song that they were singing, and it was a song um, called Miracles that we're going to sing today together at the end of this service to close this service out. And it was written, and, and he'll explain it, but it was written in a time of, of very hard circumstances, and I want you today, as soon as this video is over, we're going to go, I'm going to read a scripture and we're going to go straight into some worship. And if you need healing in your life, if you need comfort, if you need to take your eyes off the things around you and place them on the things above, and you need together to walk with God for your strength, what I want you to do is I want you to respond. I want you to come to the front of this place. I want you to lift your hands and worship. And, and I want you to really just release that to God because in his presence is everything that you need to overcome whatever it is that you see. Do you understand that today? So take a step of faith that says, God, I don't get it. I don't understand. But that's okay. I know who you are. And I know that you will not leave me. That you will not forsake me. Uh, This song was written by one of the sons of this house. He wrote it after his baby died. It was his confession that God is good and he works wonders. We're going to sing it all over again. Now, a friend of mine, Dick Mills, he's with the Lord now, but he told us a story years ago. He's really being harassed by the devil. So he got two chairs, made them face each other in a room. He said, devil, sit down. I'm going to worship God, and you're going to watch me. (laughs) And if you knew Dick, you knew that's exactly how he would do it. We've come here with all kinds of opportunities, open doors, levels of favor. We've come with all kinds of challenges. We've come with all kinds of problems. We've come with all kinds of stuff. And I'd like if there's any way you can do it, just stick all of it right in front of you. We don't need greater strategies. We don't need, I believe in it, but we need him. We need the almighty God to be so present upon us, with us, in us, through us, all around us. And I don't know, we may sing this for another hour, except we probably exhaust the team, but I I want us to sing this song for a while. I want them to start at the beginning. And I want you to take everything you can think of that you're facing. That's a challenge, that's an impossibility. I want you to look at it solid and then begin to declare that our God is the God of miracles. Our God is the God of miracles. Second Corinthians chapter one says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You want to know how to do ministry, how to love people? You want to know how to see people saved, transformed, delivered? You want to see how the Holy Spirit works in in, in your life and through your life? This is how you do it. You ready? You allow yourself to be comforted by God. So that we may comfort others. So that we may release the love and the goodness of the Father. You see, you can't release anything that you don't have. I can't give you a hundred bucks because I don't even have my wallet on me today. That's a problem. I drove here. 
I can't give you something that I don't have. What is the key to you being empowered by the Holy Spirit to go into all the world, to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to to comfort those who mourn? You and yourself have to understand what that looks like. And it is not dependent on your struggle. It is not dependent on your situation. It is not dependent on your past. It is dependent on you saying yes to the Father in heaven and saying, God, I don't know. I don't get it. I don't know why you do. I don't understand the plans and the purposes, but I know that I love you with all of my heart. And I know that you are my strength in my time of weakness. I know that your plans for me are to prosper me, not to harm me, to give me hope and a future. And I live in an expectation that says God is good and his mercies endureth forever. And I I will respond in such a way that my life leads people to the feet of Jesus. You cannot give that which you do not know. You can't give what you don't know. So Father God, today I choose to worship you. Even for just this short time at the end of this service, I choose to stand before my King of Kings and Lord of Lords and declare I don't understand, but I worship you. I put my eyes upon you, the author and finisher of my faith. I ask for wisdom because I don't have it. I ask for your goodness and your love because I don't have it. I ask for your comfort because those around me need it. If you're with me today, would you please just stand to your feet right where you're at? You're welcome to come to the front.